What is up everyone? Hope you're doing well today. This is Rafael Garcia here on a early Saturday morning, May 30th. And I have a few different things to talk about with episode 60 of the Let's Talk Wrestling podcast. As always, I want to first say thank you for taking the time to listen to me talk about wrestling. And especially with everything that's going on in the United States right now. Um, today's SmackDown was a pretty good break. From what's been a very hard week, hard couple of weeks, but this week especially, a lot of the different things that are going on. But before we jump into that, um, I want to say thank you for following me. As always, you can catch my wrestling content um, wherever I am on social media at rgarcia underscore sports. MMA ratings, you can always go over to our flagship over at mmaratings.net where you can rate the fights and let us know what you thought of action that just passed. You can catch our content at MMA Ratings on Instagram and Twitter. And our podcast, which is this, and our Tuesday show on MMA can be found across streaming and podcasting channels uh, such as Spotify, Apple iTunes, Google Podcasts, and Anchor as well, too. So thank you again for taking the time to check us out. So I am going to spend my time today talking about WWE content from the week, AEW, some stuff from there, and also touch on this George, George Lloyd situation. I can't ignore that, so we'll be talking about that too today for um, a brief second. So let's go ahead and jump right on in and start talking about WWE first. Um, just some things from this past week of action and content that I think are definitely worth talking about. First is that the WWE has moved to using wrestlers as a crowd um, starting on Monday. And this is a clear ripoff of AEW, which is okay because it was something that was needed, something that they should have implemented a long time ago. And you've already seen a, a improvement in the shows in just this week. Um, there clearly was a lot, of posit- a lot of positive reactions to them taking these steps. The people around the ring are um, NXT talent. They did, they did a bunch of tapings earlier this week. One thing I would like to see that would be different, though, is if main roster talent were around the ring for WWE NXT, but they didn't, they're obviously not going to do that. But uh, I have been enjoying what they're doing with having the talent around the ring. They have, like, plexiglass up, so it looks a lot like what you would see at a hockey rink, which I'm okay with. Um, I don't think we've seen a lot of people get thrown into it yet, maybe between that um, Bobby Lashley, Drew McIntyre brawl from Monday Night Raw, but it is something that is a change, and it's a positive change, and it's definitely theft, stealing right from AEW, but they did what they had to do, and I am all for it, because it makes these shows much easier to watch. Like Smack, Everything actually flew by this week, SmackDown Raw and um, NXT, uh, so that's what, for seven hours of WWE content, I can honestly say that really flew by. Even Simone Johnson, uh, the rock star, she was one of the individuals that were in the crowd on Monday. They didn't say anything about her, but they showed her a couple of different times. They didn't say who she was, though. Um, the big moment from this week was probably Apollo Crews winning the U.S. title, and this is an important moment for Apollo. This is his first WWE Championship. He's been with the organization since 2014. And a lot of people were really worried about him since he was being brought up, or since he was brought up to the main event roster. To the main roster, he hasn't been utilized. He, and everyone knows that he's much better than they were leveraging him. And unfortunately, it took for a global pandemic for the WWE to have to deal with a roster that was basically cut in by three quarters. So they leaned on him and it allowed him to really kind of flourish in this time. I want to say all of that really started when you had that basically that 30 minute match with Austin Black uh, last month. Right, I think it was right after WrestleMania, and they tore it up. Um, Cruz is good. His, I know people think his character is kind of bland, and I understand that, but I think he could get that over. Not necessarily the blandness, but I think he has more character to offer there. It doesn't have to be the smile all the time um, baby face, but the more like charismatic, I know I'm the shit type of baby face, I think that that can really work for him I'm glad he got that title put around his waist uh, I think I saw there was like a, a image going around of the black P 
people who have held black men who have held the United States Championship since 2003. And there's a lot of great names on there. Uh, Booker T, obviously, Ricochet, Kofi Kingston was on there, uh, Big E. Uh, Orlando Jordan, which is one name that you do not hear anything about, but he was on um, that group as well. So there's a lot of MVP was there too, I think. There's, there's a lot of great names on um, in that group, and I'm glad that we saw Cruz get added to it. I do believe that he's someone that could be the first African-American main uh, WWE champion. And before people will say, well, Mark Henry held the belt or the rock, da 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 Mark Henry was never the main WWE champion. He was the he was the WWE champion when that title was secondary, and The Rock has never been talked about as being an African American uh, on WWE content. His father is Canadian. His mother is Samoan. They focus on the Samoan heritage. They hardly never talk about him being black, even though the fact that he got over first is being a part of the nation of domination. So you know that's really that's just what they do. They've completely white whitewashed his family history, in my opinion. But my opinion doesn't really matter on that. However, still we're talking about Apollo Crews, and I do believe he could be someone who is the first African-American champion if they book him properly. So here's me knocking on wood. Here's me hoping for the best there because WWE doesn't have a good track record. So let's see what happens there. Over on NXT, Drake Maverick, he won the triple threat and moved into the finals. I love this finish where... Kushida goes for the avalanche armbar on Jake Atlas, and Drake dives on top. Well, he didn't dive all the way on top of Drake. He just draped his arm, he draped his arm over Atlas. And since Atlas is on his back being armbarred, uh, the ref counted the, the pinfall. And I really liked what I saw here. Atlas was tapping as the ref counted to three. But Kushida basically stepped aside and told Drake Maverick to go fight for the title and fight for his job. So this is big to me. I, I really enjoyed I enjoyed this whole tournament. I am not as excited about the finish, about the finals. I think they're going to put the belt on Phantasma and they're gonna have him win by you using those luchador goons in some way, shape, or form. They're going to actually cost Drake Maverick the match and it'll be revealed that Phantasma's been behind it the whole time. I hate that idea, but we know that that's some shit that WWE would do. I really hope that they put that title on Drake Maverick, especially after the fact that they kept him around for so long and he put them in a position to want to keep keep him around. We saw that, I think last week, is when Drew Gulak was supposedly released and WWE already brought him back. He was on SmackDown this past weekend. His contract expired. They worked out a deal with him because they saw his value and they didn't want him to go anywhere else. Hopefully that's it, not that, not that they just didn't want to keep him from going somewhere else. But um, I hope they did do the same thing with Drake. I I would be remiss to think that they would let him go and allow him to show up somewhere like AEW, somewhere that would leverage him as more of a, of a wrestler, because you know that's exactly where he would go, especially with the popularity that blossomed once um, the news broke that he was supposed to be one of the individuals released. So next week we get Phantasma versus Drake Maverick for that title. Charlotte Flair needed a tag team partner to go up against Io Shirai and uh, Rhea Ripley, and Chelsea Green was paired with her. And I think that this is a good move. Green, at first, I didn't, I, I didn't like that she was being being pushed. Um, you know, I just, I, I always release a sigh of apprehension when I see a new white woman being pushed at a time where there are a bunch of women of color on the roster that aren't being utilized. That's another show another conversation within itself. But Chelsea Green did very well in this role. She seems like somebody that would play second fiddle to Charlotte Flair, someone that could that would be a, be her heater and take her pinfalls. But this was a great um this was a great rub for her. Uh she took a bullet for for Charlotte, allowing Charlotte to pin you know, um Shirai. They did a backstage segment that was I saw on Twitter where Chelsea Green fires Robert Stone. I don't know why they didn't do that on TV. They should have did it on TV. I don't know where it's going to lead. He's been tweeting about it, uh, basically trying to beg her to come back. Um, but I'm liking Green. I think she could be every bit as good as Britt, Britt Baker is over in AEW. You know, a lot of people have been talking about Britt coming in, into her role, coming into her position more, and people in, kind of embracing it, and people really embracing her, embracing that, that shitty heel character that, that she's been playing and everyone's been loving it. I think Chelsea Green can do something along the same lines. Like, 
they're really slim. They're, they're, I don't want to say they're similar in anything about them, but man, they're only three weeks apart. So they both have a lot of upside. They're three, three weeks in age. Um, I think with Green, what was the other one? Let me look again. No. Yeah, Green's the older one by like three weeks, 19 days to be exact. So I'm interested in seeing uh, what these two ladies do, but I think that uh, Chelsea Green can be every bit as good as Britt Baker. Um, we got a Leon Ruff sighting. You know, that gets me excited because the man gets out there and he sells like a genius. Sell, sell, sell. That's what he gets out there and definitely does, but he got squashed by Tommaso Ciampa. Um, I am kind of intrigued by the match that they have coming up at NXT in your house or NXT TakeOver in your house with Ciampa and Karrion Cross, I think that's his name. But Karrion Cross now, I want to call him Killer all, all, all the time. Scarlett came out and watched the match, um, but you know, no interactions there. Karrion cut a promo, nothing really important to take from that. But I just wanted to highlight my boy Leon Ruff getting out there and getting more work. This fight pit match between Matt Riddle and um, Timothy Thatcher was good shit, pal. Imagine me right now with a rolled up magazine in my hand, smacking it. Good shit, pal. Because this was amazing. Um, love the brutality of it. Matt Hardy. Uh, Matt Hardy. Yes, I love the brutality of it. Matt Riddle takes the L. He gets choked out. That was basically his send off for him to be called up to the main roster because he is coming over to SmackDown, which was uh, announced on today. But a lot of people already had that news from earlier in the week. But here we are now with SmackDown. And yeah, I got some thoughts about this show. Tonight's show, it was good. I enjoyed it. Uh, it again, it did not feel like a drag. It didn't feel like it was me staring at the clock as the show went on today. But I wasn't a fan of the opening. We got the segment where Jeff Hardy was basically, it looks, obviously the storyline is going to be that he was framed for drunk driving and that he hit um, Elias. I, with everything going on in the country right now, with riots breaking out over major urban areas all across the country, Minneapolis, Atlanta, um, Houston, Texas, LA, Vegas, no one well, not, not, they're not all right. It's going to be a protest and uh, some, yeah, some some that are borderline riots, but most of them are protests. People are out there protesting against the murder of George Lloyd, and we'll talk about that in a second. With all that going on, I don't think I wanted to see police officers manhandling Jeff Hardy or trying to arrest him. With all that going on right now, I think that was just in bad taste. Um, it didn't leave the best taste in my mouth. But what it segued to was a battle royal was set up where the winner would face Daniel Bryan in the main event. Now, AJ Styles was like, I'm not fucking wrestling. I'm going to sit back and take my bye to the, um, to the finals. But Daniel was adamant about fighting, and I think that's, that's just stupid because if anyone knows in a tournament setting if something as important as something that is important on the line, you take the bye every single time. No one in their right mind would be like, yeah, I'll fight, I'll fight any of these guys and we'll do it tonight. No, that's just stupid. Dolph had a very hilarious line. He was talking to um, Jimmy Uso and he goes, Jimmy, Jay, I don't know which one you are. I don't really watch. That cracked me up. No one talked about that, but it was a nice little um, slick line. Sheamus won the Battle Royal. Chad, Gray, Chad Gable had some great moments. That set up a match between Chad Gable and Cesaro later on in the night where Gable wins, at, at, at reversing a powerbomb into a roll-up. He got a match between Sonya and Lacey. I thought, that that was, I thought it was good. Um, both of these women are steadily improving. I like Sonya the best, Sonya Deville. There was a moment where Lacey was like uh, basically trying to goad her into a strict wrestling match by taking referee's position in the middle of the ring. I wish Sonya would have acted like she was going to and, um, take the take the position. I wish she would just kick her square in the ribs. Like, be a jerk. Be a heel. Just kick her dead in the ribs and like get your heat. But um, the match ends in a double count out, which is great for both of them involved, too. I don't think that hurts either one of them. We got the tag team, se tag team summit segment, and 
I was, uh, you know, kind of like, uh, like good old Lemon Lionel voice. Uh, you know, I don't know about that guy. But this summit was not that great to me. The match between Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross was well was well done. I love Alexa uh, Alexa Bliss. Uh, excuse me, Alexa Bliss. I love Nikki Cross's character. She just she is the epitome of professional wrestling. The way she presents her character it was fantastic. Watching her and Bailey leave Michael Cole and Corey Graves cracking up. They were trying so hard not to laugh on camera, going back and forth. So that was awesome. We got the the um the main event was. Brian against Daniel Bryan against uh, Sheamus. Sheamus was about to win with the bro kick. He was setting up for that. Hardy comes down, distracts him, and Brian gets the win. Hardy then runs in and, and attacks him. And you know, I, I I've all I've said this multiple times in the past couple months. I think Matt uh Greg, goodness I almost said Matt Hardy. I almost said Greg Hardy. I think Jeff Hardy is overrated. I'm not a big fan of his. And I'm not here to see him get some big redemption run back to the title. I'm just like, what? I, I think he's probably, well, he must be about to wind it down. And they want to give him one more reign before it's all said and done. But I've just never been a fan of Mr. Jeff Hardy. Just never, ever, ever been a fan of his. So that's WWE content for the week. Um, it's really kind of the big news with them. I have not seen much other stuff. It's just like I said, this has been a this has been a tough week for me, mental health wise. But all in all, WWE's content has been good this week. The shows have been enjoyable, easy to watch. They don't drag. I'm not like playing on my phone all the time or flipping back and forth to something else. This is some pretty strong content. Uh, I want to move on now to topic number two and talk about AEW and some of their content from the week. And I think this, uh, I, okay, so I'm going to go back to Double or Nothing first, and then we'll talk about uh, Dynamite from this week. I didn't get a chance to watch AEW Dark. I'm going to go back and watch that. But Double or Nothing was fantastic. It was a great show. Again, I keep saying about AEW, when I watch the Wednesday Night Wars between the two groups on it, and people are going back and forth, the thing about AEW that stands out the most to me is that people talk about it in a way that exudes fun. It's almost as if they're having fun. It's like you're at two parties. WWE is one party, AEW is another, and people are talking about AEW like it's so much more fun than the party that you're at. This week's content may not have translated into that. It had some great moments, but I want to talk about that main event. But AEW definitely seems to be the, the fun promotion. And Double or Nothing really embodied that. My top five moments was um, from least to most favorite. Yukaro Shida winning the women's title. I think that's great that they put the title on on her. Um, she's deserving. She can go. She's probably the best women's wrestler on their roster. I love everything about her. I am a fan for um, Hikaru Shida. She pinned uh, Nyla Rose. And that was the one match where... Coming into it, I had no idea which way they were going to go. I thought they were going to keep the belt on Rose to continue building her up into a um, monster heel. I believe they want that title. I, I think the title is going to – well, before Saturday, I thought the title was going to go from Rose to Statlander to Baker. But that may have been the original plan. Let's we'll see what um, happens down the line. So that was my fifth one. My fourth moment was laughing at Mike Tyson when he was yawning at Vince the ringside. They accidentally, the camera crew accidentally caught a video of him yawning at, at, at the action, which was hilarious. Moment number three, Taz in Brian Cage's corner. I think this is great for Brian Cage. It helps him have a mouthpiece. I don't know what his promos are, are, are like, but Taz is a guy who people across generations know. And it's clear that AEW is being concerted or making a concerted effort with placing prominent names on the show to get people interested in them. So Taz with uh, Brian Cage is no different. I think it's a good mix there. Um, I absolutely adored everything about the Stadium Stampede match. This is number two, so there's a number one. But everything about this match screamed like production, screamed 
creative intent screen like you know we don't take ourselves too seriously it was fantastic and I enjoyed it from start to finish even within that I could give you my five favorite, favorite moments that may be a, a show for another day but they tore it up my number one moment from Double or Nothing though good old Orange Cassidy comes out during the Casino Royale ladder match looks at the ladder goes over to the announce booth and says how do I win this thing Oh, and like his character is just so great. He has that disdain of like, I don't want to do anything. Can you do it for me? And it works perfectly. I love it every time I uh, see it. So he was definitely my top moment from um, the pay-per-view this past weekend. If you get the opportunity to watch it, go back and watch it. It, it was a lot of fun. A lot of, again, it was the F word. It was a lot of fun. Turning over to AEW Dynamite for this week. Um, the big news from that is we got FTR arriving. I'm guessing their name is Fuck the Rest. It was uh, Fuck the Revival or the Revolt or whatever that may be. But we're just going with FTR right now. They come out there. They save the Bucks. They beat up Butcher and the Blade. And they hint at like a mutual respect situation with the Bucks. Which I think this works because... It allows AEW to have some time before they have to do something big with this feud and they can get them in front of live fans. So I think that that's what they're kind of holding out for and I'm not mad at them for that. There was another Battle Royale on Wednesday where Jungle Boy wins and he gets the first shot at Cody in his TNT title next week. I have some thoughts about Cody at some point in time I'm going to have to share. I need to add that down to my list of things to write about. Um, Orange Cassidy and Jungle Boy, they tore it up too, though. They were the they were the last two. And we know Jungle Boy's going to lose to um, Cody. That match isn't, that title isn't going anywhere quite yet. That brings me over to Brian Cage. His squash match was great. The best thing about this was Taz letting him use his uh, catchphrase, beat him if you can, survive if he lets you. I think that's fantastic. Taz, Taz is great. He's one of my favorite guys. Taz is uh, fantastic, and I wish I, he would have had more time on top when he was in WWE, but his ECW run is good shit. We got a Cody segment, and he's talking about doing an open challenge every week, starting with Jungle Boy next week. You know, I'm not sold on Cody. I've said it a couple times. I get that like, he... He is that early days wrestling that I watched growing up when I was younger. He's very, he has a very territorial mindset of it. You can tell in his matches, that's what he's really influenced by. You get all of those shenanigans and all that other stuff. But it just, it doesn't work for me right now. Um, I would like to see him do something else. I would like to see Cody be, be something a little bit different than the type of wrestler he's being right now. It was working. He is one of the more over people in the organization, probably the most over. But it's just not engaging to me. I'm just not um, a fan of it. What is engaging, though, Britt, Britt Baker and her conspiracy theory segment was hilarious. Again, I will admit, I wasn't sold on Britt Baker two, three months ago. Go back and listen to some of the past episodes, and I'm like, ugh, get her off my television. But she's playing this role very well. She is acting a lot like Chris Jericho used to act back in his WCW Man of a Thousand and Four Holds days. She's going to be huge. She's going to be out until all out because of the injury to her leg. She broke it. She suffered she said, a broken tibia on um, AEW Dynamite. No one knows if that's true. But she is, she's all right. I'm not in my head. She's all right. We um, got a Hikaru Shida match. I'm not going to talk about that just because Jeff or um, JR has some ridiculous lines during that match. The main event segment. So, uh, I watched this twice. And I have mixed feelings about it. The opening piece with just... Uh, the inner circle was funny as they always are together. And I appreciate that. Love those guys for that. Then we get Mike Tyson's music, and he walks out there with Henry Cejudo, Vitor Belfort, Rashad Evans, and some other guy who has black eye paint on. 
making a complete fool out of himself. So they go back and forth about the moment from 10 years ago where Tyson snuffed uh, Chris Jericho on WWE, knocked him out. Okay, I get it for continuity's sake. But why are all these other individuals there, first and foremost? And then second of all, does this mean we're getting some type of segment with or some type of storyline with Jericho and Tyson? Because I love I love Mike Tyson. I think he's a national treasure. I'm saying that in, in, in jest. But he shouldn't be on television. He shouldn't be on AEW. He shouldn't be in the main event. Like there's so many different things that AEW could be doing with Jericho. That is almost laughable. I think he's the best entertainer in pro wrestling today. The best. He makes you interested in everything that he does. However, I'm not interested in any in seeing him do anything with Mike Tyson. Not interested in seeing that at all. He should be working with guys they are trying to establish. I don't think Kenny Omega is, is established from a North American standpoint, even though he's one of the best wrestlers in the world today. That feud could last six months and it would be something fantastic. He could be working with Scorpio Sky, introducing who I hope introducing the one who I hope will be their first African American champion, hopefully much sooner rather than later. He could be working with Jungle Boy long term. He could be working with Orange Cassidy long term. There's so many different things that they could be doing with Chris Jericho to help other people get over that I just don't like the idea of Mike Tyson stealing his time. Use Jericho while you still can. He's not going to be doing this forever. He's at a position now, actually, where he could call it and retire. I'm sure he'll probably live pretty damn well. He has Fozzie. That's her name, right? Yeah, he has Fozzie out there doing their own thing. He doesn't need this. So, But AEW needs him. That's very key there. He doesn't need this, as he doesn't need WWE, or he doesn't need AEW money, but AEW needs him because he right now is there. He makes everyone elevate their game, and Mike Tyson doesn't have a wrestling game to elevate. I think it's a waste of time. If they wanted to do something where Mike Tyson knocked somebody out or got into a Chevy match and kind of cleaned somebody up, use Sean Spears for that. That guy's not doing anything. Use one of those other, other, other jokes that can do something like that and see if you can find better um, situation because AEW right now I am not a fan of what you're doing with Mike Tyson and he's supposed to be back next week cutting promos and shit like that no I'll pass but that is all I wanted to talk about from the wrestling spec um, wrestling world I would like to turn my attention to what's going on with George Lloyd and not necessarily just him but just this past week we got the Amy Cooper is her name, the white woman who was walking her dog in the forest or in, um, what is that park? Central Park, New York, where she was approached by a young black guy. His last name is Cooper as well, too. I can't think of his first name. But she basically threatens him, calls the police, saying that African-American man is threatening her now the reason why she did that is because her dog wasn't on the leash and cooper told her to put her dog on the leash but what's scary and frightening about that is the very next day we see a video of george lloyd being held down by a police officer on his back with his knee across his neck lloyd is pleading for help pleading for his mom who was dead He's just pleading, 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 and he ended up dying. And since then, we've seen a lot of civil unrest, which I think is long overdue. You had the President of the United States tweeting out information, talking about um, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. And that is a key term that was used back in 1967 to talk about the riots that were going on in, was it Orlando? Was it Florida or was it South Carolina? Can't remember the exact place of the riots that were going on at the time, but that is the slogan that the police chief in that area used. He was a notorious bigot. I can't remember his name off the top of my head right now, but he was a notorious bigot. And to see the president of the United States, 85, 
number, or excuse me, the number that he is getting the like this whole this whole situation is just unfortunate like I'm watching it and you feel powerless because we are really in the situation or in some ways and you're just hoping that it will all end at some point you're just hoping that these issues with race and police violence against people of color you're just wishing that they would end at some point it doesn't seem like they ever will especially when you have donald trump in the office doing what he's doing trying to do to corrupt as much of our our way of life as possible and he's being aided in that some voices are amplifying his message of course you have the people who are Chaining out, well, responding. What about black on black crime? Why are they why why are they rioting? Why are they disturbing, destroying their own neighborhoods, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. That's not going to help. Of course, you have those voices popping up left and right, but you have a lot of voices pushing that down because finally, finally, everyone's looking at this situation like, yo, this is just flat out disgusting. There's no if, ands, or buts there. George Floyd did not have to die over an alleged forgery of a check. That turned out to be real. He didn't have a die over that. And as more and more information comes out, this is looking worse and worse. All they had to do was arrest the man. That's it. But they let him sit for a couple of days, and the people said, okay, we're not going to protest. We're going to burn shit down. And I saw one amazing um, Instagram post where it was like, like the protesters are the people that come and sit at the table, and the looters are, are the hired muscle when we need to tear shit up. And that's really what it is. There's a lot you can really unpack about this situation and about a lot of these matters that we're seeing over the over the past few weeks. Like there's since the uh, Ahmad Abery Arbery video was leaked, four people I think have been killed by four black people have been killed by cops in in questionable situations. Four. There's a young man who caught himself who um, taped his death on Facebook Live. There's um, Breonna Taylor, there's George Lloyd, and there's one other. I can't remember what the, uh, the the fourth guy, but this needs to end. It needs to stop because we are tired. I'm tired. We're exhausted, and we did not create this situation. We didn't, so we shouldn't be asked to fix it. We should be able to sit back and watch as white people look at, look within themselves, and they fix it. So I just want to send, send take a moment to say. Um, to my peers, people who look like me, please be safe if you're going out there rioting. Don't let people see your faces. Don't like keep your tattoos covered, keep your face covered. Protect yourself. Protect yourself. Protect yourself. Be smart out there, please. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. And this situation is upsetting to me. And I wish everyone cared about it as much. So with that in mind, we're going to go ahead and close out this week's episode. Um, again, you know, my name is Raphael Garcia. This is episode 60 of the Let's Talk Wrestling podcast. You can find me at rgarcia underscore sports. You can check out all of our content over at MMA Ratings. You can find everything that we do there. Um, yeah, that's really it. Stay safe, everyone. Have a good night.